Um, at this point, we've basically done it all. I mean, we have talked about how to like count things, how to predict how much of something we're going to generate in a reaction, how to balance chemical reactions, how to almost predict the product of a chemical reaction. We've also talked about how to think about an individual element and how many valence electrons it has available for bonding and for actual chemistry. And we've also talked about how those individual elements bond together and how we can draw Lewis structures. And after that, we kind of go a little bit schizophrenic. We start to add, like do two things at once. The first thing we do is we, we go at gas laws and we say, OK, gas laws, let's treat every molecule as though it's just a dot or a little ping pong ball that slams against other ping pong balls. And it doesn't matter what the identity of the particular molecule is, as long as we know the temperature and the pressure and the volume and the number of moles or some combination thereof, we can figure out what the missing variable is, independent of what the identity of the molecule is. And what we're going to cover today is we're going to cover how the identity of the molecule and its, or I guess, electromagnetic properties change its physical properties and change how it interacts with other molecules. So in the gas laws, we don't care about that. We ignore it. We idealize their behavior as being little ping pongs. They don't attract each other. And then for intermolecular forces, we're going to talk about how they actually do interact with each other. Um, so when I'm looking at this question, uh, the first thing that I look for is what are they asking for? Because I always get this confused. So it looks like they're asking for pressure. And they give us moles of helium, moles of oxygen, and a volume and a temperature. Um, so if I go to, if I, if I look at this website and the fact that I actually wrote the stuff out, um, here I've done some work and I've said, okay, the number of moles is just the number of moles of helium plus the number of moles of oxygen gas. And the reason I can get away with this in the ideal gas law treatment of these gases is that I don't care if that ping pong ball is two oxygen atoms stuck together or if that ping pong ball is a helium atom. As long as it's a discrete molecule or atom, I treat it exactly the same way in the ideal gas laws. That means I get to add together different gases. So if I had like a sample of gas from the atmosphere, I'd treat it as just a sample of that many molecules of gas. I couldn't care less that it had nitrogen or oxygen. Um, as long as I can calculate the moles, I'm home free. So they already gave me moles. I just add them up. Um, if you look at that, the least accurate place here is the tenth place in 1.9 versus the hundredth place in 4.49. So that means I'm going to have to have two sig figs when I'm done. I left additional decimal places so I don't have rounding error. They gave us number of moles, volume, temperature. Notice that with temperature, I am converting it to Kelvin. For all the ideal gas laws, if you have a temperature, you need to convert it to Kelvin. This is the uh, Ideal gas constant, R, and that's just what it is. I wrote it down. So if I look at the fact that I'm trying to find P and I have N, V, T, and R, I'm going to use this formula, P, V equals N, R, T. And uh, for your uh, you know, general understanding, as far as I'm concerned, you only need to know or be able to use two different equations, one of which is this one, P1, V1 over T1 equals P to V to over T to. So this equation in green, P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. This equation is very useful. This is this plus this other equation, PV equals NRT. These are basically Swiss Army knives. Like w with, with those two and maybe like a little bit of understanding of how the ideal gases work, you can do any question. All right, so like if they give you volume and temperature and, a, and another volume and they ask for the new temperature, you would just assume that the pressures are equal. You just cancel out those P's and you'd be left with V1, T1, V2 over T2. Use an algebra to solve for T2 and then just plug in the numbers. R is the ideal gas constant. It's this. That's a great question. I would have this in your notes. And if you don't want to put it in your notes, it is on the inside, like the first page page. Yeah, you can look this up online. Uh, you can't use a computer on the exam, but in, in real life, you can look it up online. Um, but yeah, it's in this first page, and you could look it up again. 
So yeah, it doesn't change. It's not like problem dependent. Every problem you use this one. Um, the only time you might use a different version of R is if the units are different. But if they give you ATM or if you can convert to ATM in liters, just use it. Um, OK, so I'm trying to find P. And they give me all the other stuff. So I just solve that equation for P. And I do that by dividing by volume on both sides. Um, if this algebra trips you up, uh, please send me an email. And we could literally go through all the different ways you could solve this equation for any of the variables. And then you just be able to plug and chug from that. Um, Anyway, so if, if I do this problem, I plug in all the values and their units. And if you look at this, R should make all the units kind of like cancel out and leave you with the units you need. So if I look at this, I have moles and I have divided by moles. Those two cancel. Let me grab my pencil again. So eh. I have Kelvin and I have divided by Kelvin, so those two cancel. I have liters on top and liters in the bottom. So the only units that are left are atmospheres. And that's the answer I get when I plug it into Excel, or when you plug it into your calculator, you should get that. And I only get to use two significant figures here, because if I think about it, when I did Kelvin, that 25 was only accurate to the units place. So that means that 298 really is the like significant part of that. So it only has three sig figs. And when I added these two together, it only had two sig figs. So when I do all the multiplication, one of these values, the end value, only has two sig figs. So that means, and also this, this five liter thing only has two sig figs. So I can't be more accurate than two sig figs. So that's it. And if I look at my answer choices, wrong one, of course, um, I see that C is the answer. So I want to talk about the different phases and just sort of explain what's going on in each of them again. So remember how solids are like well-defined. You know where an atom is. You know where the other atoms are. If you look away and you come back, they're in the same place. They don't shift around. Their locations are stable. In addition to that, I should mention that solids have a lot of intermolecular forces. So the atoms are really close together. They've arranged themselves so that they're interacting with each other in a beneficial way. To break up that solid so that like the atoms are moving around kind of randomly means that I have to break those intermolecular forces, or at least some of them. So the stronger the intermolecular forces are in a solid or between molecules, the more energy it takes to break them up into a liquid, to separate them out a little bit into a liquid. And that means that I'm going to have a higher melting point for higher intermolecular forces. The same goes for a boiling point. So a boiling point is when you go from liquid to gas, right? Um, so when I go from liquid to gas, there's even less interaction between gas molecules than there are between liquid molecules. And that means that I'm breaking, I'm also having to like sort of pay this energy cost to break them up a little bit and get them into a gas. So the higher the, more, the stronger, the more powerful the attraction is between different molecules, the harder it is to break up a liquid into a gas, and the higher the boiling point will be. Something like table salt, which has ion-ion forces, is going to be very hard to turn into a liquid. I'd need to like heat it really, really high. I've never seen molten table salt in my entire life, and I hope never to. <laughs> and uh, to make like uh, a sodium chloride vapor, a table salt vapor, I have no idea what energy that would take, but it sounds terrible. That energy penalty I was talking about, the heat of fusion is how much energy I'd have to put into a, you know, amount of ice to turn it into liquid water. The heat of vaporization is the amount of energy I'd have to take to break apart the liquid molecules into more distantly connected, or really not connected at all, um, gas molecules of whatever substance we're talking about. Intramolecular forces mean molecule, or sorry, forces inside of a molecule. So things like um, bonding. But intermolecular forces, I'm talking about how a particular water molecule can interact with another water molecule and how they can attract each other. All of these forces that we're talking about are inherently based on like charges and electromagnetism. They're not based on gravity. They're not based on molecular mass. 
So a common mistake people think is that, oh man, if this molecule weighs more, has a higher mass, that means that it's going to have higher intermolecular forces. It's going to be attracted to itself by gravity. Like, like one molecule of helium will be attracted to another molecule of helium by gravity. This is not how things actually work. Gravity doesn't really, it's not a very strong force until you get lots and lots of matter together. Matter the size of like planets. Like you don't even feel gravity for me and I'm kind of fat. And like my molecules are even like way, 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 way lighter than that. They don't feel any gravity really at all from each other. So these aren't gravity forces, these are charge forces and any argument you make or that you, that you accept as an answer choice in an exam should have something to do with these charge-based forces. The ones that I would talk about in this class that, that I think will come up a lot are ion-ion, a unit of sodium chloride, table salt. The sodium and the chloride attract each other because one's positive, the sodium, and one's negative, the chloride. But they also are attracted to other sodium chloride molecules or you know, equivalents out there because those also have corresponding charges that can arrange themselves and uh, attract each other. So those are full charges and those full charges attract each other very strongly. Hence, table salt as a, you know, as a solid really isn't going to be melted very easily. The next strongest is hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a very specific interaction. I'll define it later, but it's stronger than the other ones. The next strongest after that is dipole-dipole interactions. And the least strong is London dispersion forces. Now, this is really tricky to talk about because there are so many names for it, it's very common. Um, so here come some names that you may have heard it be called by and they all mean the same thing. London forces, dispersion forces, London dispersion forces, van der Waals forces, um, induced dipole, or also it could be called induced dipole, induced dipole forces. All of these mean the same thing. They mean temporary charge changes in a otherwise pretty much neutral molecule. Um, or I guess I should just say temporary charge changes that lead to attraction between molecules. Okay, uh, so wh what do these things mean in terms of physical properties? So if I have weaker intermolecular forces, that means that I'm going to have a lower boiling point, and if I have stronger intermolecular forces, I'll have a higher boiling point. If I have weaker intermolecular forces, I'll have a lower um, melting point, and if I have stronger intermolecular forces, I'll have a higher melting point. If I have, high, if I have weaker intermolecular forces, that means that there's going to be more molecules at the surface of a liquid, or I guess even at the surface of a solid, kind of like popping off the solid. They don't get held as tightly. So that means it's going to be higher vapor pressure and stronger intermolecular forces means lower vapor pressure. Let's talk about hydrogen bonding. You know there might be some hydrogen bonding if you have an OH, an NH, or an FH bond and you have a lone pair on an O or a nitrogen or a fluorine. If those two things are existent in your molecule, then you can actually have the lone pair of the O or N or F interact with the H. And it'll look like this. Let's pretend we have like water and hydrogen and fluoride. And let's draw in the proper Lewis structure. There's some electrons. That is an H bond. So what's really going on here? If you were to draw the dipole moments based on the electronegativities of these molecules, or in these molecules, the electronegativity differences, you would see that this fluorine has a partial negative charge, and this hydrogen has a partial positive charge. So the electrons in this bond are spending a lot more time around the fluorine, and therefore this is partially naked hydrogen. 